Merci, Alfonso. I, I would love to give this talk in French, but I've been away for too long for me to be able to do that effectively. So, unfortunately, I have to give it to you in English. There are two things I want to convey today. I, I had a wonderful day. I, I listened to a number of the talks. I was very happy to see to hear the word la classe inversée so many times. It makes me think that everybody in France teaches a flipped classroom. <laughs> I guess that's not true, right? <laughs> but I want to have um, basically two take-home points at the, um, at the end of this talk. And I want to start by going back to when I started teaching physics. I've been at Harvard for almost 40 years now. I started teaching in 1984 when I became a professor there. And um, looking back at that very first class I taught, what strikes me is that I never asked myself the question, how am I going to teach? Which is kind of strange, because when you do something new in your life, that should be the first question you ask yourself. Did not come up in my mind, that question. It was perfectly clear what I was going to do. I was going to do to my students what my professors had done to me, lecture. And I think we all tend to do that same thing because we are the products of that approach to teaching. And unconsciously, we make the assumption, I learned it this way, therefore my students are going to learn it that way. And I'm quite sure that my professors, when they started teaching, made exactly the same assumptions. And their professors did. And, you know, going back generations after generations after generations, all the way to this person here. This is actually King Henry VIII of Germany, Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, giving a guest lecture at the University of Bologna in 1100-something. It's an illuminated, it's a, it's a drawing from an illuminated manuscript from much later, from the 15th century, but it represents a, a scene in the 1100s. Notice the incredible similarity between that picture and the first picture I just showed you a moment ago. Look at the people in the front, you know, they're, they're paying attention and they're taking notes here. In the second row, they look slightly less interested and a little bit bored, maybe. And then in the back corner, the people are talking to each other. And then there's this person in the front. I <laughs> we no longer wear those robes when we lecture. I don't know how it is here, but at the graduation ceremonies in the US, we still wear these medieval robes to remind ourselves that we are steeped in medieval traditions. As I said, the similarity is uncanny. Now, I haven't been lecturing like this in a long time, so I really had to look in my photo archives to find a picture of me standing in front of a room, not very different from this room here. It, this is a very old picture. It was taken B.C. Before computers. I'm, I'm not that old. <laughs> now, I want to ask you, what is it that is actually happening in that picture behind me? I would like you to describe in one or two words, no long, you know, speeches, just one or two words, the process that is depicted in the screen behind me. And there are two, and ideally I want you to use a verb, but there are two verbs I do not want to hear, teaching and learning. So you'll have to say, in a different way. So go ahead. What comes to mind when you see this picture? Listening. Listening. Showing. Showing. Watching. Watching. Speaking. speaking. You said speaking? Yeah. Yeah, good. Hearing. 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 Now notice silence. silence. Well, listen that, uh, 
notice that everything that we've heard so far either pertains to them, the students, or me, the instructor. Right? Silence, they're silent, I'm not silent. Speaking, I'm speaking, they're not speaking. Listening, they're listening, I'm not listening. Showing, I'm showing, they're not showing. So everything we've heard so far is either them or me, but we're both in the same room at the same time. What is it that is happening between them and me? Interacting. Well, <laughs> I'm doing my best to interact with you, and it's not easy. It's not easy in part because of the architecture of this room. Who is responsible for the architecture of this room? <laughs> or that room? Or any other learning space in most universities around the globe? Who is responsible for that? Probably I'd go further back in time. The Rome, the Greek, exactly. This all goes back to the theater and then later the amphitheater by the Greek. Now, why did the Greek develop this architecture? For what? Yeah. Theater, exactly, so that everybody could see and everybody could hear the performers in front of the room. Now, remember, you came in here, you sat down, and I'm sure that in your mind, unconsciously, you were thinking, I am going to listen to Eric Mazur talk, because that's what the space does to you, just as when you go into a theater or a cinema or anywhere else. And it would be inappropriate in a cinema or in a theater to speak up. And that same mindset you bring to a classroom designed like this, it's focused on the person in front of the classroom. Now, the Greek were smart enough not to use the theater as a learning space. I don't know if you've ever seen a um, depiction of the school of Athens, but it was very different. People walked and talked and discussed. So at least the Greek were smart enough not to use the performance space as a learning space. But clearly, somewhere in medieval Europe, we adopted the performance space as a learning space and I think that automatically turned the audience into a passive audience. Sorry, this was a long answer, so I don't think there's any interaction, right? So we need another, another description. If it's not an interaction, what is it? Sharing, sharing. but sharing is again both ways, right? I share with you, you share with me. Message passing. Message passing, what's the message? You tell me. <laughs> Sometimes people say, I mean, the passing I like because the verb that I'm after is transmission. Something is being transmitted from me to them. What is it? In a general sense. No, I hear two verbs, uh, two words here, knowledge and information. Now think about it. Is knowledge something that we can transfer? Can you just transfer knowledge? I don't think so. It'd be terrific if we could do it. It would be even better if we could do it while people are sleeping. But I don't think you can actually transfer knowledge. Knowledge is something that needs to be constructed in the brain of the learner. So the second word that I heard, information, I think is exactly that. Lectures focus on the transmission of information. And you know what? My students had actually rubbed that in my face. They, they told me that that was what I was doing. Not quite in those words, but they did. And I had, not, in the first year that I taught, and I did not listen. In fact, I got upset. You see, when I taught my class for the first time, as I just admitted to you, I never asked myself, how am I going to teach? But there was a question that did come up in my mind. Not how, but what, exactly. So I went to a colleague of mine who had taught the course before, and I asked him that question. And he said, in this course, we have used, in the past, the book by Halliday and Resnick. For those of you who are physicists, you may know that book. It's been a classic for 60 years. And he told me that the students would buy the textbook which to me, coming from Europe and having been educated in Europe, 
you know, struck me as kind of odd. Why buy the textbook if the instructor is presenting the content of the book to you? But anyway, I did as I was told. I went to the bookstore and I made sure that I, to tell the people in the bookstore that by September 15th, 110 students would buy Halliday and Resnick and that they should have enough copies in stock. And as I walked back from the bookstore to my office, I thought, wait a minute. If the students have the textbook and I have the same book, then what do I do in the classroom? <laughs> so I went back to my colleague and I knocked on his door and I asked him that question. And he said, oh, don't worry. There are lots of different physics textbooks. And he showed me a collection of books that he had collected over the course of his career. And I started to look, and very quickly, I found the perfect book. It was perfect for two reasons. One, it was different from Haldane and Resnick, so at least I was not just regurgitating the content of the book that they had bought. But that was not the important reason. The important reason was the book was out of print. <laughs> so for each class, I spent, what, 10 hours preparing a set of lecture notes, which in class I would project on the overhead projector, or I would write them on the board behind me. And because my notes were different from the book that they had bought, I thought it would be good for the students to have a copy of my notes. Remember, this is BC, so it's definitely BI, before the internet, so I could not distribute them electronically. So by the end of class, I made sure that near the back doors there were copies of photocopied notes, so that as they walked out, they could pick up a copy of my lecture notes. Now, why do you think that I hand them out at the end of class and not the beginning of class? <laughs> Why? So they would pay attention, but isn't that already admitting that there's a problem? I mean, why force the student to get the information out of my mouth if they could get it from my notes? That idea never occurred to me. But you know what happened? What happened was that that very first year, at the end of the year, about half a dozen students wrote in the end of semester evaluation of the course, they wrote, Professor Mazur is lecturing straight from his lecture notes. <laughs> Hello, I mean, what was I supposed to do? Develop another set of lecture notes to lecture from that was different from the lecture notes I handed out to them? These ungrateful students. Anyway, I ignored it. But what happened was rather remarkable. I was teaching a course that none of my colleagues wanted to teach. Physics for pre-medical students. These were not students who wanted to learn physics, no. They already hated physics before coming into my classroom. And consequently, these students were not very kind to physicists and tended to give very poor evaluations at the end of the semester. So, when I became assistant professor, my colleagues said, let's have Eric Mazur teach that course. Anyway, the students liked my lectures and they ended up giving me very high ratings, 4.8 or 4.5 on a five point scale. On top of that, they did well on what I considered difficult exams. So, what was that telling me? that was telling me that I was actually doing a good job. And since most of my colleagues did not get high evaluations for this course, I very quickly started to believe that I was the world's best physics teacher. <laughs> now, that turned out to be a complete illusion. It was a very pleasant illusion, but it was an illusion nonetheless. Yes, they liked me as an instructor, and yes, they could pass the exam, but it turned out, after teaching for about six or seven years, that my students were not even learning the most basic principles. They were simply memorizing and solving problems by rote procedures which they had memorized. I found out about that 
which was kind of an eye-opening moment, by reading in the literature a test that tested students' understanding of Newtonian mechanics was not the typical textbook problems, but with problems that refer to the real world and that used only words. A heavy truck and a light car colliding, blah, 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 and so forth. And the author of that article claimed that students in introductory physics courses did very poorly on those questions, and in fact, if you gave the questions at the beginning of the semester, and then again at the end of the semester, there was very little difference between the two, showing that the students did, you know, the course did very little to change students' primitive beliefs about the world behind, ar around us. Well, I read this and I said, no way, not my students. But you know, I'm a scientist, so I've learned not to make statements, but to actually get data. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to give it to my students and see how they do. Just to prove that I'm a really, really good teacher. Well, within a minute after they started taking this test, one student raised her hand. And I walked up to her, and she looked me right in the eyes, and she said, Professor Mazur, how should I answer these questions? according to what you taught us, or according to the way I usually think about these situations? <laughs> I had no idea how to answer that question. And by the time the test had been completed, my world was changed forever. This was back in 1990. And after thinking about it for a while, I realized that education was much more complicated than just transmitting information. Yes, the transmission of information is important. No transmission of information, no education. But it's not enough. Something needs to happen in the brain of the learners. They need to assimilate that information. Building the mental model so that you can take what you've learned and apply it in a new context. Connect it to your own experiences. Have the aha moments. Oh, now I get it. That really internalizes the knowledge. I've often asked myself the question, where did this happen for me? Where did it happen for you? Did it happen while you were sitting in a classroom like this, listening to your professors? I see some, most people shake no. I think occasionally it may have happened in the classroom, but more often than not, it happened outside of the classroom when you were going over your notes and thinking, how do I make sense of this? But you see, we, you and I, became professors. We had the intrinsic motivation to figure it out on our own. To assume that that will happen for our students, most of whom are not going to be professors, is a very big assumption. So in the traditional approach to education, all of the emphasis in class is on the transfer of information. And then the students are sent home or away. And the second part is sort of expected to happen on its own outside of the classroom. Now, if you ask yourself which of these two steps is the hardest, the transfer of information or making sense of the information, I think we'd all agree the second step is the hardest one. So it's kind of ironic that we spend all our time on step one leaving the hard part to the students on their own. And yes, as I said, it worked for us. But clearly, it doesn't work for everyone. So that's when I decided that I should really focus on that second step, not the first step. That's when I came up in 1990 with the idea of inverting the two. Now people call it the flipped classroom. I didn't use that word. I just said invert the sequence throw the transfer of information out of the class so that we can help our students make sense of that information. 
So I don't want to talk right now about the first part. I'm going to talk about that later because it's not completely trivial. I want to talk about the second part. What do you do in the classroom if your students have successfully found a way to transfer the information on their own? I know that's a big assumption, but I'm going to ask you to accept that assumption for now. I'll come back to it later. So how do we help our students assimilate the information? The answer to this question is nothing new. Teach by questioning rather than by telling. Who is the first person who said that? Socrates. Socrates, exactly. It's not that I was sitting in my office thinking, what am I going to do, what am I going to do? Oh, Socrates. No, no. <laughs> no, it was a completely serendipitous discovery. You see, after I gave that test that I just told you, that consisted of 30 word-based questions to my students, not only was I shocked by the results, which showed that 60% of my students were still Aristotelian thinkers at the end of the semester, rather than Newtonian thinkers. Not only was I shocked, they were shocked too. And they were worried, because they knew that an exam was coming two weeks later. So they asked me for a special session to talk about every question on that test. So I booked a large classroom like this. I had 250 students at the time. And between 7 p.m. and 10 p.m. at night, I worked through all of the 30 questions. And I remember at one point that I got to a question that talked about a truck and a car colliding and compared the forces that the two were exerting on each other. And I thought, that's simple. That's, you know, Newton's third law. Action is reaction, or the force of one on the other is the same as the force in the other direction. So I made a drawing of the car on one side of the board, the truck on the other, and I drew the forces of gravity, the forces from the road, and then the force of the truck on the car, and the car on the truck, and I turned around, and I said, these two forces are equal by Newton's third law. What more is there to explain about it, right? I could at once see from the faces of my students that they were confused. So I said, is there a question? Complete silence. They were so confused, they could not articulate a coherent question. So I thought, this is a problem. Maybe they are confused by the fact that the effect on the truck is smaller than that on the car, but that's because the truck is heavier. So I erased the board, and in the next eight minutes, I gave the most brilliant explanation you could possibly imagine. Newton's second law, Newton's third law. I had the whole board covered by equations. I'd worked out every little detail you could imagine. Of course, I'd done this all with my back to them in order to write on the board, and when I turned around, they looked even more confused. <laughs> And they could still not articulate a coherent question. I didn't know what to do. I knew one thing, however. I knew that half of them had given the right answer on the written test. So in a moment of despair, I said, why don't you just discuss it with each other? And something happened I'd never seen before. Complete chaos. They all started talking to each other. I mean, they forgot about me in front of the class. I could have walked away. They would not have noticed it. But what was even more surprising was, in just two minutes, they figured it out. I thought, how can that be? I, the expert, have tried for 10 minutes in two different ways, unsuccessfully, and Jay just talked to each other two minutes and get it? But actually, I think it makes a lot of sense. Suppose you have two students next to each other, John and Mary. Mary has the right answer because she understands it. John does not yet understand it, does not have the right answer. On average, I won't claim that this always works, but on average, Mary is more likely to convince John than the other way around, simply by the force of logic. But that's not the important point. The important point is this. Mary is more likely to convince John than Professor Mazur in front of the class. Why? Because she has only recently learned it. She still knows what the difficulties are that a beginning learner has. Whereas Professor Mazur has learned it such a long time ago 
that he cannot even imagine why somebody has any difficulties. It's what my colleague, the famous psychologist Steven Pinker, calls the curse of knowledge. It's an ironic argument, right? You tend to think the more of an expert you are, the better positioned you are to teach it. But the reality is, we forget. We forget our own struggles, and over time our explanations become more and more polished, but less and less effective at helping a beginning learner learn. It's what Susan Ambrose, in her beautiful book, How Learning Works, calls the expert blind spot. We're no longer aware of the things that we know that a beginning learner does not know. So when I saw that engagement, that level of activity, I thought, that's how I should teach. And the next year, I didn't lecture at all anymore, and I have not looked back since. Do you want to try it? Yeah. I'd like to have more than one person be enthusiastic <laughs> here. Do you want to try it? OK, good. Much better. So I hope you all read those two paragraphs. Oh, sorry. I should first, I should first show how I teach. Uh, pardon me. I didn't run you through the, uh, through the little sequence. So I, I walk into class. I ask a question. I give time to think. You see, this is another big problem with the lecture. There is no time to think. Why? Because your brain is held captive by the speaker. Suppose that you need to think about something, that you have a cognitive dissonance, and you go, hmm, I wonder about this. Your mind wanders, and you're no longer listening, because our brains are not capable of doing two things at once. We cannot continue to listen and think about something that has been said a few minutes ago. So the best students can do is quickly scribble something down and tell themselves, I'm going to think about this later. But as I said, most of them don't have that capability of resolving that later on. Have you ever had a student in your class raise his or her hand and say, Professor, could you please be quiet for five minutes? I need to think. <laughs> it's never happened in my class, but you see, that's one of the big shortcomings of the lecture. There is no time to think. Here, you have time to think because it's silent and people think. Then I poll them. Initially, we did that by putting the hands on the chest, indicating the choices. One, two, three, four, five. There's no more than five, usually. Right? So I ask students to select an answer, and then I count to three. One, two, three. And then everybody has to put their hands on the chest at the same time. I tell my students, and this will hold for you too, if you do not put your hand on your chest, I will come to you with this microphone, put the microphone right in your face, and you will have to tell the whole room what your answer is. They quickly put their <laughs> hand on it. Okay. So I try to aim the question so that between 30% and 70% get the right answer. If it's more than 70%, then there's not going to be much to discuss. If it's less than 30%, there are not enough students present to teach the others. The question is simply too hard. But if it's between 30 and 70%, I tell my students, find a neighbor near you who has a different answer and try to convince that person of your answer. You will need to do the same thing. So if you turn to your right, and that person has the same answer, don't start talking. Turn to your left. And if that person also has the same answer, then don't assume that you're correct. Turn to a person in front of you, or behind you, or get up and walk around. You must find somebody who has a different answer. Two minutes of complete chaos. And then I pull them again, and it's not unusual if you start between 30 and 70 to go to 80, 90, or even very close to 100% the second time. And then I end up with an explanation, which can either come from the students or from me. And then the cycle repeats until the class time is up.
And of course the aha moments, the oh yes, happened during this discussion. Pay attention to it while you're engaged in the discussion in just a second. Now, I heard a lot about the um, clickers today. I even saw some illustrations. Unfortunately, so, so after I developed this method in the early 90s, we started wanting to collect data and we had a wired calculator to collect data and then later the first very primitive infrared clicker and now there are RF and even you can use apps on your, your phone to do it. But I think that unfortunately as people started to adopt the technology, they forgot about the pedagogy. And many instructors are simply using the clicker to wake up their students and throw away the interaction between the students completely. So that's why I'm not going to use a clicker, you're going to have to use your hands on your chest. And remember, if you don't put your hand on your chest, I'm going to come to you. Okay, so did you all read those two paragraphs on thermal expansion that I asked Alfonso to email to you? Did we forget? I, I'm just kidding here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, but you know, look, since you didn't read anything, it would be unfair for me to ask you a question. So let, I'll have to lecture for two minutes on thermal expansion. You know, actually, I'm very happy because I miss lecturing in my own classes. And I love lecturing. So let me lecture for a second. So thermal expansion deals with the fact that hard solids like wood or steel or concrete expand when they get hotter and contract again when they get colder. This is very important in engineering um, and much more than engineering but especially in engineering when you build tall buildings you need to take into account the expansion of steel which is much more than that of other materials or when you put down rails for trains as you can see in the background of this picture you have to take account that the rails when it gets hotter will expand now you should not expect that when you put a pan on the stove a pot on the stove that it gets twice as big when you turn the gas on no it gets a little bit bigger but enough so that it's actually measurable and in some cases like rails it can have a very large cumulative effect over the entire length of the rail so engineers who build buildings, engineers who put down rails for trains need to take this expansion into account. Your dentist needs to take this into account or you will be very unhappy. When your dentist fills a cavity, if he or she were to use an ordinary metal to fill a cavity, you would have a very big problem the next time you drink a cup of coffee because the metal would expand and they expand more than a tooth so it would crack the tooth so it affects you personally too now the reason hard solids and I'm only talking about hard solids not soft solids not liquids not gases hard solids expand is that they're made up from atoms I'm showing nine of them here and these atoms hold each other in a fixed pattern I have a square pattern here but it could be any type of pattern and the atoms, when it gets hotter, get further away from each other. So that's hot. And this is cold. Hot and cold. That's all you need to know to answer my question. Now, you may wonder, why is it that the atoms get further away from each other? Again, I'm not going to ask you that, but just to satisfy your curiosity, the reason is that atoms don't sit still. They vibrate. And the amplitude of that vibration is related to what we call temperature. So these are cold atoms, and these are hot atoms. Cold atoms, hot atoms. So if you were an atom, you wouldn't just sit like this. You'd actually be shaking back and forth. And as it gets hotter, you shake more, and you need more space, as do your neighbors. So, so cold and hot. And by the way, it's not just those nine atoms that I show here. It's all of them, the millions and billions of atoms that make up a uh, solid. Cold and hot. Questions, anyone? <laughs> Thank you for reaffirming that I'm an absolutely brilliant lecturer. <laughs> there is not one question. But you know, 
I am not going to hide this and then simply ask you the question, when solids get hotter, they expand because A, the atoms get closer together, B, they stay the same distance, C, they get further apart. That would be me delivering information to you and then you delivering that same information back to me. That would not, that's not education, although frankly, I think that's a lot of what is happening around us at you know, many institutions, including mine. I'm going to see if you can take this, this model of atoms getting further away from each other, all of them, and apply that to a different context. So you better ask me questions before I ask my question. Cold? And hot? Come on. Is it? Yes, thank you. Ah, oh, see that? Why is the one in the center not moving? I'm going to answer your question. You're not going to like my answer, but it's true. The one in the center is not moving because to prepare this slide, I made two drawings. I made them in Adobe Illustrator in case you want to know. I made this drawing with nine atoms close together, and then I make made a second drawing with the atoms further away from each other and I put the two on top of each other with the central atom on top of, for the two drawings. That's why it's not moving. <laughs> well, actually, it's a really good question because that's a choice, right? I could have made another choice. I could have, instead of taking the central atom here, and putting that on top. I could have taken that atom, this black atom, on top of the gray atom underneath. In that case, what would have happened to the central atom? It would have moved down and towards the right. And this atom here in the, in the center of the left, instead of going to the left, would have gone down. So now it would have been the top left atom that would not have moved, and all the others would have moved. But the, that's not what matters, which atom stays where. What matters is that all the distance are further, all the atoms, pardon me, are further away from each other. And that's true independent of my choice of where I put the second drawing. And remember, in a real solid, there are not nine atoms. There are not nine million atoms. There are not nine billion atoms. There are not nine billion billion atoms. No, there are billions of billions of billions of atoms. So the position of any one atom doesn't matter. It's only the relative position that matters. Good question. Thank you for asking. Way beyond what I'm going to ask. Is there a limit? Good question. So we start cold. We heat it up by, let's say, 10 degrees. And then they expand. We heat it up by another 10 degrees, they expand by the same fraction. And we heat it up by another 10 degrees, and they expand by the same fraction. Suppose you take a metal and you keep heating it and heating and heating it. What happens at some point? It melts, right? The atoms are so far apart from each other that they can't hold that pattern anymore. And it makes a phase transition to another phase. We won't talk about that. Are you ready for my question? Good. Remember, no talking to each other before I tell you. <laughs> if you talk to your neighbor before I tell you, I'm going to come to you with this microphone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's the question. Consider a rectangular metal plate with a circular hole in it. If you take this plate and you uniformly heat it, the metal expands. And the diameter of the hole will get larger, stay the same, or get smaller. Think about it. You don't have to vote yet. I'll tell you when to vote. Who wants more time to think? If you want more time to think, wave at me discreetly, like this. OK, we have a few people who want to. If you already have the answer and you don't need to think anymore, ask yourself, how am I going to convince somebody else?
that I'm right and he or she is wrong. Okay, well, in the interest of time, look, the, the answer you choose d doesn't matter, okay? It, it really doesn't matter. It will not affect anything. It will not affect your salary. <laughs> so, so, so don't worry, okay? Don't worry. But you have to put your hand on you. You have to put your hand on your chest with a choice. At the count of three. One, two, and three. Everybody, keep it there. Wait, there's no four. <laughs> 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 Keep it there for a second so I can see. What about you? This is not on your... You have to put it on your chest. Okay. But that's five. I mean, there's no five. One, two, three. Okay, I see threes, I see twos, I see ones. <laughs> Every answer. I, I see including some answers that are not there. Four and five, I have no idea. So find somebody who has a different answer and try to convince that person that you're right and he or she is wrong. Go ahead. Everybody, if you don't talk to somebody else, I'll come and talk to you. Now look at you. You all got engaged. You've already made my point. The answer to this question doesn't even matter. Look, they're still talking there. They're, they're, they're unaware. He, he's unaware that I've started talking again. And there too. It's okay. The answer doesn't matter. <laughs> imagine, imagine I had given the same little lecture about terminal expansion that I did a moment ago. But instead of asking you the question, I would have said, let's now apply this to rectangular metal plates with circular holes in it. If you take one of these plates and put it in the oven and turn up the temperature, the metal expands and the diameter of the hole will... I'm going to keep you in suspense a little bit longer. <laughs> you would have been sleeping! I mean, what is more boring than rectangular metal plates with circular holes in it? <laughs> and look at you now! Isn't it amazing how you can reawaken the curiosity of the human mind. I mean, think about it. Small children, four, five, six years old, they don't stop asking why. We are born to learn. Our minds are wired to try to explain the world around us. And you, me, everybody else, we pester early in life, our parents and our teachers, with the question, why? If anything, education does a really good job turning this innate curiosity that we're all born with off. And by the time our students come to our universities, it's no longer about the why. It's, a, it's about how do I get the right answer to pass the test. Well, the good news is that I have just shown to you how easy it is to turn that curiosity back on. Because trust me, if you can do this with rectangular metal plates with circular holes in it, you can do it with anything. Anything. Now, before I tell you the answer, let's analyze what happened here. I asked you a question, and you thought about the question, and then I had you make a commitment. And it's a low-stakes commitment. If you ever do this in your classes, do not give your students any credit for the questions. Why? Because if you give them credit, they will want to find the right answer not to satisfy their curiosity, but to get the point. And that changes the picture completely. If I had told you your salary will go up by 10% if you get the right answer, you would have probably gotten your phone out and quickly Googled the question rather than think about it. The same is true for our students. So you made a commitment, and after you made the commitment, I asked you to externalize your answer. You had to turn to a neighbor, and you had to say, I chose, hmm, what do you have? And something interesting happened. I did not even have to come and listen to you. I could see it, because many of you were gesticulating. 
you moved away from the answer or the fact to the reasoning. It was no longer about the answer. It was how do you argue about the answer? This process brings the thinking process back into the classroom. It devalues the answer and puts the value on the reasoning. But most importantly, you became emotionally invested in the learning process. If I were to tell you, oh, 5.30, bye, I'm leaving, you come running after me to ask me, what is the answer to this question? Well, again, I'm not here to talk about thermal expansion. I'm here to talk about pedagogy. But let's finish the round. Now, before I can give you the answer, you have to indicate what you now believe to be the right answer. So if you've changed your mind, you indicate what you now believe to be the right answer. If you've not changed your mind, you vote the same way you vote the first time. OK? At the count of three. One, two, and three. Everybody. <laughs> Keep it there for a second. Everybody. Right? You cannot make up your mind still. <sighs> <sighs> <laughs> You know, I thought I gave a very clear lecture on thermal expansion. And you did too, because hardly anybody asked any questions. Only about 30% or so of you, maybe even less, a quarter, got the right answer. Which is actually pretty much what I wanted. Because by voting the way you did, you have been telling me, Eric, your lecturing sucks. <laughs> Which is the point I wanted to make, right? It may sound clear, but you haven't even really begun to learn, right? It sounds so clear, a lecture, but you haven't had time to think about it yet, to internalize the knowledge. Yes, the information might be there, but the knowledge is not there yet. Uh, you know, you should really have done your reading before coming to my class, but that's another point. The right answer is, look at you, it's just, everybody, I mean, there were some people on their computers there, and even they looked up. It's just amazing. The right answer is, can I have a drum roll? Answer number one. And, and I'm happy to report, I'm happy to report, look at that. I'm happy to report that more than a quarter had the right answer the second time. So there were a couple of you who had the aha moment I wanted to have. Now, again, I'm not here to talk about thermal expansion, but I would hate it if tonight you're in bed, wide awake, <laughs> at 2 AM. <laughs> so let me take a minute to, to, to wrap this up, and then I want to talk about the out-of-class component. Imagine you have a, jam, a, jar, uh, a jar of marmalade in the refrigerator, a glass jar and a metal lid. The lid is one of these rings and a plate, right? So you take it out of the refrigerator, you try to open it, you can't open it. What do you do? You heat it up, you run the lid under hot water. The ring gets bigger. And therefore, you can unscrew it. You say, well, you didn't ask about a ring. You asked about a plate. OK, OK, OK. So let's say we have a plate. This is the plate. No hole in it. No hole in it. OK, we take a pen and we draw a circle. So now we have a plate with a circle. Can you imagine that? We put the plate with a circle in the oven, turn up the temperature, the plate expands. What happens to the diameter of the circle that we've drawn? gets bigger, everything gets bigger, so the circle will get bigger too. You say, that's unfair. There's no hole. If there was a hole, then the metal would expand into the hole. And in fact, I did see quite a few threes the first time and even the second time. Let me show you what's wrong with that. Let's say that we all go outside. It's nice and sunny, so we can do that. And we all form a big ring holding hands. Each of us is an atom at the edge of the hole. Can you imagine that? Each dot is one of us, an atom at the edge of the hole. And then I count to three, and we all at the same time step in towards the center of the hole. What just happened to the distance between us? 
It got smaller. It can't get smaller. We're shaking more. Our neighbor is shaking more. We need more space, not less space. The only way to make more space, or the only ways to make more space, would be one, to remove a few of us, but atoms don't disappear like that, or to make the whole larger. <laughs> you won't forget this. OK. Look at that. Everybody, there's. Are you talking about the hole in the plate? <laughs> yes, yes, they're talking about it. I'm here to talk about pedagogy, OK? Look at them there. Look, look at them, the three of them there. <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you for making my point. Isn't it just amazing how you can capture the mind? I mean, we saw the proof here, right? And trust me, your students, no matter how you think of them, are exactly the same. Trust me. Try it, and you will never look back. OK, so back to peer instruction. I, I, I want to talk about something else, so I'm going to cut this short. Uh, but the first year that I did it, I doubled the learning gains. So from beginning to the semester to the end of semester was twice as large as when I lectured. Not a 10% increase or a 20%, no, 100% increase. And over the years, by asking better questions, I tripled it. And many other people have shown it in chemistry and in, in all kinds of disciplines that I couldn't even imagine people using this approach. In fact, here it is, the tripling that I got after doing this for a couple of years. And not only higher learning gains, but also better retention. Imagine you have this aha moment in class. <gasps> oh, yes. That means you know it for life because you can think the right way. It's so empowering. Even if you forget the fact, you know that you figured it out and you can figure it out again. It's so empowering for a student or for anybody for that matter. So in the last ten, ten minutes or so, do I still have, have, I've lost track of time here. I was having fun here. All right. So I, I want to very briefly talk about how do you get your students prepared for this, right? I mean, we've eliminated this lecturing. So how do you effectively transfer <clears throat> the information out of the classroom? Well, my first impulse was to have the students watch the video from the previous year's lecture. Already in the 80s, I was recording every single lecture on a VHS tape. And they were in the library, and students could review them. But there's a big problem with video. First of all, the transfer pace is set by the speaker on the video, so you, you inherit the shortcomings of a lecture. There's no time to think. Yes, you could pause the video without having to ask the speaker to stop. You can pause the video. But you know what? Students do the opposite. Harvard is one of the founding partners for edX. And you, I've reviewed some of the data. It turns out most students who watch recordings of lectures put the playback speed at 2.0, the maximum. I didn't even know that was a 2.0. I thought it was 1.5. No, 2.0 to get through it as quickly as they can. So there's even less time to think. Also, the viewer is passive, right? You're still passive. You sitting there passively listening to somebody talk. Also, very quickly, the students figure out that they don't have to watch the whole video. They can quickly go through it, answer a few multiple choice questions, and then pretend that they have watched the video. And lastly, it's an isolated individual experience, right? The student at home or wherever, and the video. Deep down, learning is a social experience, not an isolated experience. You need interaction one way or another. So by having students watch videos, what we're doing is moving this out of the classroom, which doesn't mean it's not happening. We just don't see it, which is maybe a little bit better. Then I thought, let's have them read. Because when you read, you are in control of the transfer pace. I'm sure you've had this experience that you read, and all of a sudden your mind starts wandering, but you're, you continue to read. And then all of a sudden, you, you realize that you know, you're no longer parsing the words, and you stop. So at least you are in control of the rate at which the information goes in your brain. 
And also, research has shown that the brain is much more active during reading than it is during watching a video. However, it's still an isolated individual experience, the book and you. And there's no real accountability. If I tell my students, read chapter 22, how do I know that they actually read chapter 22? Well, it took me 20 years to come up with the right approach. Because what is it that we really want? We want every student prepared for every class. The first class of the semester, the second class, the third class, all the way to the last class. And also, I don't know about you, we don't want to have to put in much additional effort. It's already hard work to teach. So there's already so much that we need to do. So the solution to the problem, and I don't know why it took me so long to come up with that idea, is to turn the out-of-class component, the transfer, also into a social experience. So five years ago, uh, two colleagues of mine and I made f this platform, which is free to use, perusal.com, you can use it for free, and it works in French, although the interface needs to be updated, there's still some strings that are not translated, but it works in French, with which we can guarantee every student prepared for every class. And again, it's free. If you want to use a commercial textbook, there needs to be an agreement with the publisher, of course. But if it's your own materials, it's completely free. So what is Perusal? It's a, what I call a social learning platform. Students log in through the learning management system. I saw that a lot of people here use Moodle. I don't know what other platforms, Canvas, Desire to Learn. But anyway, most of those platforms are connected through an LTI interface, it's called. So Perusal can work directly with them. Or they can log in through their preferred social network. And once they're online, it looks like an e-reader. But it's not an ordinary e-reader. The first thing you see is that up in the left corner, you can see who else in your class is also reading at the same time. And if you're reading and there's something that you don't understand, you can highlight the text. And when you highlight the text, it opens a chat window. And you can start typing in the chat window. And as soon as you hit return, the highlight sticks. And other students in the class can see that highlight, either if they're online or if they come online later. So after a while, the whole page will be marked up. And you can click on any highlight and see a transcript of a discussion between students. I'm going to make this a little bit larger so we can read it. It's probably still too small, but I'm going to read it for you. Here at the top, there's one student. This is her Twitter or Facebook picture. I don't know, because she connected her social profile. This is on October 12, nine minutes after midnight you get a lot of insight into when your students are reading the text with this problem. She writes, I don't understand how this combination of factors, blah, 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 and so on. Half an hour later, October 20, 12.38 AM, another student with the initials SB writes, I think, oops, pardon me. I think you may be able to think about the direction separately, blah, 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 blah. Two days later, on October 22nd at 8.48 PM, a third student writes, this is a great question to further elaborate, blah, 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 and so on. So what do you see here? You see here an asynchronous peer instruction between students happening before the class. The students helping each other understand the text in preparation for the class the next day. So how do you get your students to participate? Well, ideally, I would like them to participate because of intrinsic motivation. But I guess you know, your students are probably not very different from mine. By the time we get them to university, they're mostly extrinsically motivated to learn, not intrinsically. So we use a combination of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation drivers. So let me start with the extrinsic one, the, the, you know, the stick with which you're going to hit them if they don't. Essentially, we have a rubric-based assessment of their annotation. The students are told that through their annotations, they must demonstrate thoughtful reading and interpretation of the text. So if all a student does is highlighting text and says, I don't understand this, I don't understand this, 
I don't understand this, I don't understand this, you get zero points because that's neither thoughtful nor thorough. You can do that without reading. If you highlight things and you say, I don't understand this because on page blah, 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 it says something, you get partial credit. If you highlight something and you write, I don't understand this because on page 256 it says blah, 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 and I thought that, and you reveal your thinking, you start to accumulate real credit. So we want a certain minimum quantity of thoughtful annotations. We want them to be on time before the class. And we want them to be completely distributed over the reading. So if you have your students read 10 pages, you don't want them to put all of their annotations on the first page and then say, I'm done. So with this rubric in my class, which has 60 students, we get in one semester 20,000 annotations. 20,000 annotations. The students write more text than the author of the textbook. I'm not kidding. So I can already hear you think, you know, how do you process all of this information? You said not more work, but if I have to read 20,000 annotations, a lot more work. Well, it is fully automated. So we use a specialized machine learning algorithm. My colleague with who I developed this platform is a quantitative social scientist who's adapted machine learning to analyze social media. Twitter, China Weibo, or we, and, and, and different other uh, platforms. It won't be able to evaluate long essays. But if it's short, it works remarkably well. See, the human mind is very good at accurately evaluating small quantity of things. But if I were to give you 20,000 annotations, after, and after grading 100, you would throw in the towel. And you would say, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is not for me. The computer is infinitely patient. And the big benefit is that when you evaluate large numbers, the computer actually turns out to be more accurate than the human, averaged over that large number. So immediately after the assignment, there's a grade book. I had to gray out the, the, the grades, the names of the students. And you can click, and you can see how many annotations, how many of them were on time, how thoughtful they were. But you see, it gets even better than this. So this is completely automated. You don't have to do anything about it. While I was developing this platform, I realized this is like having a window into the brains of my students. Because what they write there gives me insight into the processes, the thought processes in their mind. So I thought, if I know the questions they have before I get to class, I can make a much better class. Because now, rather than asking my questions, I can ask their questions. But you know, 20,000 per semester, that's still you know, thousands of annotations per class. So I uh, went back to the person who was working on this, who was programming this, and I said, could we find an algorithm to extract the main topics of confusion so that I can connect the out of class component, step one, transfer of information, to the in class component? So Perusal has, for each assignment, a button you can click on as an instructor called the confusion report. It gives you a confusion report for the assignment you've given. So this is from a class that we now have about 300,000 students using the platform all over the world. This is from a class at um, the University of Florida in Miami. And this is chapter 24 from a physics textbook, actually. And as you can see, there are three topics that led to confusion. The right-hand rule, the direction of the magnetic field, and the Earth magnetic field. And for each of these, it shows three exemplar questions. So before going into the classroom, this is not my class, but if I were to teach this class, I would click on this confusion report, and I would say, oh, right-hand rule, magnetic field, Earth magnetic field. Um, so I can make a transparency that has those words. And the next day in class, I can say, thank you for your many thoughtful annotations. It seems that the following three topics led to the most confusion. One of you asked the following question, copy, paste. Why is it that the magnetic field points away from the North Pole and towards the South Pole? I just copy the text. And if you're a student who has entered that question, you go, wow, 
he's actually read our annotations. <laughs> yeah, I read nine of them, but they don't need to know that I, 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 I had all. That is a tremendous motivator for the students to actually read in a meaningful way so that they can help the instructor improve the class. So what are the intrinsic motivating factors? Well, I didn't have time to show you everything, but the social interaction online is a lot of fun. Uh, it has a tie-in to the in-class activity, and then there's the extrinsic motivating factor, the assessment, but that's fully automated. Let me show you some data, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop, because I've taken a lot of your time. This is from a number of different classes uh, for three different semesters. The black one is the most recent one. On the vertical is the number of students who complete the assignment, no, who, who number of chapters, no, on the, ver on the horizontal, pardon me, I'm getting tired here, is the number of chapters missed before class. There were 17 chapters that they needed to read before class, but it's zero above, uh, above six. If you look at the last year in which we got data, which is this black, there's maybe one or two students who missed four chapters out of 17 chapters. Notice that there's close to 70% who missed zero chapters. They annotated every single chapter. They missed zero. I don't know about you, I missed deadlines. I'm sure you do too occasionally. Well, 70% missed no deadline. And if you add the first bar, four bar, three bars together, you get close to 95%. I think this is as close as you can possibly get to every student ready for every class, right? Because students sometimes have an exam in another class or a family emergency or they're sick or whatever, right? So you can never really get 200%. So in conclusion, I hope I've convinced you that education is not just about transferring information. It's not about getting students to do what we do. I want my students to stand on my shoulders I want my students to solve the problems that I cannot yet solve. We want our students to solve the, pr the problems that society faces that this generation cannot solve. And I don't think that teaching by telling and teaching problem solving by giving examples of problem solving will get there. It's absolutely essential that we actively engage our students and that we foster an atmosphere of social interaction both in the classroom and outside the classroom. Thank you very much.